issues for determination in Seria team. And I will deal with the first issue. That is whether this court has jurisdiction over the consolidated petitions. The first preliminary issue that was raised before us is the jurisdiction of this bench. While it was also argued that the court has already determined this matter, rendering it res judicata, we believe it is necessary to revisit the issue due to the new arguments that have emerged during submissions and in light of the unprecedented nature of the case before us. We find it prudent to further clarify our jurisdiction so as to ensure that the issue receives the comprehensive and careful consideration that it deserves. In determining this preliminary issue, we are reminded of the authoritative words of Nyarangi J.A. in the widely celebrated case of owners of the motor vessel Lillian S. versus Caltex Oil Kenya Limited, reminding us that without jurisdiction, a court has no power and must down its tools in respect of the matter in question. This principle has since been reaffirmed in numerous landmark decisions by the Supreme Court, underscoring its centrality to the exercise of judicial authority. In the case of Machari and another versus Kenya Commercial Bank Limited, the Supreme Court was unequivocal in its holding that a court's <coughs> jurisdiction flows from either the Constitution or legislation or both. Thus, a court of law can only exercise jurisdiction as conferred by the Constitution or other written law. <coughs> it is quite a lengthy um, paragraph there. However, let me also say the Supreme Court stated that where the Constitution exhaustively provides for the jurisdiction of a court of law, the court must operate within the constitutional limits. It <coughs> cannot expand its jurisdiction through judicial craft or innovation. And the quotation goes on. Likewise, in Adenga and two others versus Kibos Distillers Limited and five others, the Supreme Court again emphasized as follows. A court, even this court, that is the Supreme Court, cannot arrogate itself jurisdiction through crafts of interpretation. And a court ought to exercise its powers strictly within jurisdictional limits. End of quote. We find it necessary to address the issue of jurisdiction by examining the historical context of Kenya's constitutional drafting process, as highlighted by Learned Counsel Dr. Fiancoli in his submission. Counsel presented the court with excerpts from earlier drafts of the Constitution, tracing the evolution that led to the promulgation of the 2010 Constitution. Notably, in all these earlier drafts, express jurisdiction was conferred on the Supreme Court to hear and determine disputes arising from the impeachment <coughs> process. However, in the final promulgated 2010 Constitution, this specific provision was deliberately omitted. Based on this historical backdrop, Council submits that even if this court were to find that this dispute is justiciable, a matter which we will address in the second preliminary issue, jurisdiction should lie with the Supreme Court and not with this court. We have carefully considered this argument, which the petitioners opposed. Article 2.1 of the Constitution is unequivocal that no person or state organ is above the Constitution. It further affirms that all state authority must be exercised in strict conformity with constitutional provisions. By virtue of Article 2.4, any act or omission that violates the Constitution is both unlawful and invalid. This establishes a clear basis on which the actions and omissions of all state organs must be scrutinized for their constitutionality. The bone of contention before us 
is whether that jurisdiction ought to be exercised by this court or by the Supreme Court. As we have already noted, the final version of the 2010 Constitution marks a clear departure from previous constitutional texts regarding the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. Specifically, the provision granting the Supreme Court exclusive and original jurisdiction over disputes arising from the impeachment of the president that it was deliberately omitted. The Supreme Court's jurisdiction is now strictly redefined under Article 163, sub-Article 3. This leads us to the firm conclusion that the people of Kenya did not intend to grant such jurisdiction to the Supreme Court. Had that been the intention, the Constitution would have expressly conferred this authority in its final form. The Supreme Court has itself acknowledged that its original jurisdiction as outlined in the Constitution is exhausted. This implies that any attempt to expand its jurisdiction beyond what is expressly provided for would contradict the Constitution's intent. Again, we refer to the case of Machari and another, versus Kenya Commercial Bank, in which the Supreme Court itself stated as such. Article 163 of the Constitution provides for the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court in exhaustive terms, though leaving room for Parliament to prescribe further appellates, appellate jurisdiction in terms of Article 163, 3b2 which stipulates that the Supreme Court shall have appellate jurisdiction to hear and determine appeals from any other court or tribunal as prescribed by national legislation. The Supreme Court goes on to note that the Constitution also confers jurisdiction upon the Supreme Court to hear and determine an appeal from a judge who has been recommended for removal under Article 168.8. As far as we are aware, Parliament has yet to confer any further appellate jurisdiction upon the Supreme Court in terms of Article 163, 3B, Roman 2 above. Even with regard to the special jurisdiction previously conferred by Section 14 of the Supreme Court Act, which, is, which was repealed by Section 15 of Act Number 26 of 2022, the Supreme Court was unequivocal in again affirming that this provision did not grant Parliament the authority to expand the court's jurisdiction beyond what is contemplated in the Constitution. The court expressed this position, again we go back to the case of Mashari and another versus Kenya Commercial Bank and two others. It's important to read the text. The Supreme Court states as follows. What is the proper province of Article 163.9 of the Constitution? Does the article contemplate a situation where Parliament can confer further jurisdiction upon the Supreme Court? We hold that it doesn't. The act contemplated by Article 163.9 is operational in nature. Such an act was intended to augment the rules made by the Supreme Court for the purpose of regulating the exercise of its jurisdiction. It is an act that must confine itself to the administrative aspects of the court. It is a law that addresses the manner in which the Supreme Court exercises its jurisdiction as conferred by the Constitution or any other legislation. And they will go on to summarize, such an act was never intended to create and confer jurisdiction upon the Supreme Court beyond the limits set by the Constitution. From this analysis, we have come to the conclusion that the jurisdiction to hear disputes arising from impeachment of the President and Deputy President does not lie with the Supreme Court within the realm of original and exclusive jurisdiction. Instead, such jurisdiction may be exercisable within the Supreme Court's appellate jurisdiction. We now turn to the jurisdiction conferred on the High Court under Article 165.3 of the Constitution. Notably, 
The High Court is also vested with a broad scope of original and somewhat residual jurisdiction under Article 165.5, which grants this court jurisdiction over all matters except those explicitly reserved for the Supreme Court or for courts of equal status. This broad jurisdiction demonstrates a deliberate intention by the drafters of the 2010 Constitution to empower the High Court to address matters not expressly covered in the Constitution, ensuring that no legal issues, including as what is before us, impeachment proceedings, fall outside the Court's purview. By vesting the High Court with such extensive authority, the Constitution also guarantees that gaps in constitutional coverage are filled, allowing the Court to adjudicate on significant issues that may arise within the evolving landscape of governance. Within this framework, the jurisdiction conferred under Article 165.3 extends to adjudicating any alleged infringement of the Bill of Rights and interpreting the Constitution. In this context, Article 165.3d Roman 2 expressly grants the High Court the authority to determine whether any act purporting to have been done under the authority of the Constitution or any law is inconsistent with or in contravention of the Constitution. This reinforces the High Court's pivotal role as the guardian of constitutional integrity, ensuring that all actions by state organs or individuals are in full compliance with constitutional dictates. A closer examination of the Constitution confirms that the drafters expressly intended to exclude the High Court from hearing appeals related to tribunals established under Article 144. Given this explicit exclusion and against the foregoing discussion, if the drafters had similarly intended to bar the High Court from determining disputes under Article 145, they would have done so with equal clarity. Nothing would have been simpler, in our view, than to expressly exclude such jurisdiction in the same manner. The absence of such an exclusion with respect to Article 145 strongly suggests to us that the drafters intended for the High Court to retain jurisdiction over such impeachment matters. This approach to interpretation, whereby jurisdiction is said to be unlimited in the absence of any explicit limitation, is supported by the Supreme Court in their decision in the case of R versus Carissa Chengo. The Supreme Court noted as follows, we quote, the limits of this authority are imposed by the statutes, charter, or commission under which the court is constituted and may be extended or restricted by like means. We emphasize that if no restriction or limit is imposed, the jurisdiction is said to be unlimited. The quotation goes further, but that is the emphasis statement. It is undisputed that the impeachment of the Deputy President is a constitutional process outlined in Article 145 of the Constitution. The authority to determine whether the merits and procedures of such an impeachment process align with constitutional requirements therefore falls squarely within the jurisdiction of the High Court as provided for under Article 165.3.2. The role of the courts in an impeachment process was reiterated by the Supreme Court in the case of Sonko versus Clark County Assembly of Nairobi. That is another quotation that we have reproduced in our ruling when you get to read it. The court went on to state that the impeachment architecture in the Constitution, the law and the standing orders leaves no doubt that removal of a governor relates to accountability, political governance, 
and personal re responsibility and not necessarily about criminal responsibility. It follows that insofar as the process of removal of a governor from office is concerned, the court's role is confined to deciding whether the governor's constitutional rights and fundamental freedoms have been breached in the process and whether the procedures for removal from office have been followed without the court constituting itself into any of the two constitutional organs in whose hands the power to remove is vested. While we acknowledge that this referenced decision pertains to the impeachment of a governor, we maintain that the same constitutional principles apply to the impeachment of a deputy president. And accordingly, we do hereby find and hold that this court has the jurisdiction to sit and determine the matter that is before it. The second issue is whether